um, Sisyphus task or Tantalus uh, punishment. As you can see on this uh, ceiling painting, um, you can recognize Tantalus who was punished by Zeus uh, because uh, he abused his hospitality. And basically as a punishment, he had to stand in a pool of water and underneath a tree with low hanging fruit. Now, whenever the, he wanted to find or take some food, the branches would retreat on whenever he wanted to drink from the water, the water would recede. So basically, it's a, a tantalus punishment is a temptation without satisfaction. And on the other side here, you see Sisyphus, who was also punished by Zeus uh, by having to roll a rock all the way up to a hill only when the rock uh, near the top, it would roll down again. So a Sisyphean task is a task that's both laborious and futile. Now, to start off with, we have a problem that there is no real drugs being developed for tinnitus. And why is that? Well, that's not new. Already since 2011, there is something which is called the big pharma problem or the neuropharma problem. Um, and that's based on the fact that um, there is no real novel or innovative drugs being developed. Now, as we know, all drugs were all dirty drugs. They were acting on multiple receptors um, and they were discovered really by serendipity or modification of known drugs. For example, amitriptyline, one of these old drugs, works on more than 30 different receptors. And so its real mechanism is really unknown. Now, after Paul Ehrlich um, got his Nobel Prize in 1907, um, he developed the concept of the magic bullet where drugs would be considered as bullets that would have one single target to treat the problem. But as I mentioned, the big pharma, unfortunately, since 2011, have really stopped developing new drugs. And the reason for that is that developing a drug for uh, the central nervous system has 50% less chance to making it to the market, takes 30% longer and costs 30% more. And um, consequently, there has been 50% less medication developed for brain-related diseases because it's just too expensive and because uh, four out of five drugs actually fail phase three trials, meaning that um, when they're contrasted to placebo, the drug doesn't seem to be better than placebo. Now, the problem with Paul Ehrlich's magic bullet is that our brain, and of course he didn't know that in 1907, but our brain contains a huge amount of different um, neurotransmitters, each with different receptors. Uh, most of the neurotransmitters are glutamate or GABA, but there is also dopamine, serotonin, nor, uh, norepinephrine, acetylcholine. And to make it even worse, um, glutamate has five different groups of receptors. GABA receptors come in a huge variety. There is three kinds of opioid receptors. You've got benzodiazepine receptors, which are part of the, um, of the GABA receptor uh, group. There is five different uh, dopamine receptors and at least seven different serotonin receptors with each uh, subdivided. So basically our brain is a soup of neurotransmitters. And just like in a soup, if you just change one ingredient slightly, it won't change the soup. And therefore the idea of Paul Eric's magic bullet might not be tenable in the long run. Certainly for tinnitus, because those neurotransmitters that I've been mentioning are actually also all present in the auditory system. So the auditory system is not characterized by one or two neurotransmitters. No, it's the entire soup that is present in the auditory system. And therefore, it might be not too much of a surprise that, as uh, Karl Bauer said in the recent um, evaluation of pharmacological interventions, that there is no drug therapy that is universally effective in reducing the sensation of tinnitus. And it's not that there is not, that there hasn't been any study. If you look at the amount of different um, medications that have been tried for tinnitus, it's not that there hasn't been done any work. Furthermore, um, even meta-analytic data show exactly the same thing, that there is no medication that works at a meta-analytic level, whether it's anti-epileptics, antidepressants, ginkgo, zinc, dexamethasone um, injected in uh, trans uh, tympanically. And consequently, there is no medication that is FDA or CE approved. And basically, I could stop my talk here, except 
that the question has to be posed, of course, is all lost? Is pharmacotherapy really a Sisyphean task, meaning futile and tantalic, meaning that we can try whatever we want, but it won't work? So the question is, maybe we should get rid of this concept of the magic bullet and go to a cocktail. But why would we go to a cocktail apart from the fact that it might be nicer? Well, we have some other um, suggestions that cocktails might be single, better than a single bullet. For example, in AIDS, when Zidovudin was, uh, was developed in, in 1987, it improved survival for AIDS patients from one to about five years. And a couple of years later in the 80s, a second drug was uh, developed and the combination improved the survival dramatically. And in 1996, actually, um, antiretroviral therapy consisted uh, in a standard way of three different drugs. And that increased survival to more than 40 years, meaning that patients with AIDS, based on the fact that they switch from zidovudine as, as the magic bullet to a cocktail, have a normal life expectancy with the cocktail. Now, why would that be? Why would a cocktail be better than one magic bullet? In order to understand it, we might have to um, simplify it and look in a more mathematical and abstract way um, using uh, network signs and um, explanations. Now, if you have a network that contains the information, meaning, for example, or the symptom, for example, tinnitus, if we just randomly attack it, whether that is at the level of the brain or at the level of the neurotransmitter, nothing will happen because if we just block this neurotransmitter, the information will just flow around it and the network uh, with as emergent property tinnitus will remain. However, if we do a targeted attack, meaning that we target those nodes or those receptors that are in a combined way responsible for maintaining the uh, network, then we can dissolve the network and meaning we can treat the tinnitus. So from a practical point of view, that means that using a single target won't work, but using a cocktail might indeed work. And so where should we start? Well, luckily recently there was a, um, a network meta-analysis published that shows actually that there's two groups of medications that may be beneficial for tinnitus. One is drugs that act on the brain, such as amitriptyline, acamprosat, gabapentin, et cetera. And the other is a group of inflammatory drugs, um, which does not only consist of intradepanic dexamethasone and melatonin, but also other products. And the question is, why would we have those two groups? Why would those two groups be complementary in treating tinnitus? Well, from an um, almost um, a very primitive uh, way, our body has developed two ways to communicate to the outside world. One is via the nervous system, and our eyes pick up visual information, ears, auditory information, nose, smell, um, etc. And then there is the immune system that picks up um, microbes. But it has been uh, not too long ago, proposed that actually the immune system should be considered a sixth or a seventh sense, depending on whether you consider proprioception also a sense, and that it should also be part considered as part of our nervous system that detects input from the outside world. And so this also explains why we have multiple different signal molecules. We have neurotransmitters, which means that the brain is communicating to the immune system and the, and the endocrine system, that cytokines are the way of the immune system to communicate with the brain and the endocrine system, and that the endocrine system communicates with the immune system and the brain via hormones. And some of these products like noradrenaline is both a hormone and a neurotransmitter, meaning that this artificial um, subdivision of signal molecules might actually not be really worthwhile and that it's just traditional to call them um, as they are, but that they might maybe be better called signal molecules. But then the question is, how do we, how do we proceed pragmatically in finding a treatment for tinnitus? We can start by animal research, but the first question we have to ask, is this really beneficial? And the reason is that a rat is not a monkey and a monkey is not a brain and a rat is certainly uh, is not a human. Um, and that's um, a fairly uh, well-known statement. 
And indeed, memantine seems to be efficacious for tinnitus treatment in rats, but not in humans. Carbamazepine seems to be efficacious in rats, but not in humans. Baclofen seems to be efficacious in rats, but not in humans. So something is lost in translation here. And the problem is that uh, the concordance between animal and human data varies between zero and 100%, meaning that we can't use animal data to predict what might work in humans. Um, and so some examples is that if you look at um, cancer trials, if you take 100%, 100 uh, successful uh, animal trials, only eight will be successful in humans. If you take, there is 700 different uh, successful stroke, stroke treatments in animals, but only two in humans. And if you put everything together, um, it seems that maybe one third of animal trials might be worthwhile to predict what could happen in humans. So from a practical point of view, no, unfortunately, animal research cannot predict human outcomes. So maybe we should not wait for animal trials before we test something in humans. What could help? Well, we could start by a better understanding of the anatomy and physiology. And the first start is having a definition. This definition was recently proposed by the TRI that tinnitus would be considered the, the sound component of uh, the phantom uh, percept and that the tinnitus disorder would then be tinnitus with associated suffering. But why would you have this uh, dichotomy? Why would you talk about tinnitus as a phantom sound and tinnitus disorder as a phantom sound with associated suffering? Well, the reason is because it has different anatomical pathways. If we treat the sound, we treat the tinnitus, and we only treat a pathway that goes from the cochlea to the thalamus and from there to the auditory cortex. If we treat tinnitus disorder, we treat the same pathway, but also a different pathway that goes to different nuclei in the thalamus and from there to the anterior insula and the dorsal anterior cingulate. You might say, so what? Well, the reason why this might be relevant is because if we understand the neuropharmacology of these different two pathways, then we might have to use different treatments for tinnitus and tinnitus disorder. So what is the pharmacology of the um, lateral or auditory pathway that processes the sound? Well, this has been looked at by a team from Julik, uh, by Palermo, Gallagher and uh, Carl Zils, and what they found is that in these sensory cortexes, inclusive of the auditory cortex, meaning problem um, 41 and 42, you have loads of different neurotransmitters, but predominantly uh, muscarin type 2 and nicotinic um, alpha 4 beta 2 receptor densities, and you have high density of noradrenaline alpha 2 and 5 uh, and serotonin 2 alpha receptors uh, with normal levels for the other neurotransmitters. And of course, you have higher levels of GABA um, than you have for NMDA. And, uh, and the um, serotonin 2A receptors, you can nicely see here in the auditory cortex, but also in the anterior singlet and the posterior singlet cortex. Now, that being said, um, you can also look at the neuropharmacology of the medial pathway or the suffering pathway. And what you see there is that there is a high density of a benzodiazepine receptors, GABA-A receptors, and some um, NMDA receptors, and that even between two subregions of this uh, medial pathway, there is some differences. Now, that being said, you can also look at the pregenual or the descending pain inhibitory pathway and look at those receptors, and then you can try and create a cocktail that will activate the descending noise cancelling pathway and the uh, suffering pathway and the auditory sound pathway. The only problem is we have no idea how these receptors change in tinnitus in contrast to other pathologies. For example, in progressive supranuclear palsy, what you see is that in areas which are known to be involved in supranuclear palsy, such as the anterior singlet and, and the uh, caudate, that certain receptors have higher densities and others have lower densities, meaning that we can create a cocktail that tries to normalize these abnormal uh, receptor densities. Unfortunately, we don't have that for tinnitus. So we should try and look for other solutions and one might be to learn from pain. So how could we activate this descending noise counseling system pharmacologically and deactivate the lateral and the medial pathway? 
Now, can we learn from pain? Are we allowed to make this big leap and say, well, whatever we, whatever we know from pain, we can try and use in patients with tinnitus? Well, the good thing is that pain and tinnitus have a similar anatomy, have a similar physiology and similar clinical pictures. So there is arguments to say, yes, we can borrow information from pain and translate it to tinnitus. So what do we know, on the, for example, on the inhibitory pathway? Well, the inhibitory pathway in pain um, which um, um, uses dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, and opioid receptors. But it's not that simple. For example, in healthy people, the balance between those seven receptors is very different than in neuropathic pain, which means that we can actually look at the balance of those serotonin receptors and look for products like amitriptyline, which actually rebalance the neuropathic pain state back to the healthy state, um, or aripiprazole, which theoretically should be even better because it can, it can both um, suppress overactive um, ser uh, serotonin receptors and activate underactive uh, receptors. So from a practical point of view, that's a way to do it. Now, as mentioned, if we go for a cocktail, we should actually try and modulate both dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, and opioid receptors. So from a practical point of view, you could use uh, flipentixol, which is part of the anxiety that modulates your descending pain inhibitory pathway via its dopamine one and dopamine two receptor modulation, which, which exerts 75% more or less of the activity of the flipentixol. However, that can create tardive dyskinesias, and therefore you would add clonazepam, which is good because that's a benzodiazepine receptor, which will work on your medial, uh, on your medial um, suffering pathway anyway. So to modulate the norepinephrine, uh, we can modulate the alpha-2 receptors by using clonidine, for example, um, by for modulating the serotonin receptors in a good balanced way, we might use aripiprazole and to uh, modulate opioid receptors, we might activate the descending pathway by, for example, using low dose uh, naltrexone, which in contrast to high dose has an activating um, mechanism on uh, opioid receptors and not an inactivating. So this is just an example of how we could use knowledge and create cocktails that could be tested for tinnitus. I mean, this is not an exclusive cocktail. You could make other cocktails based on the receptors that we know are involved in tinnitus. However, unfortunately, it's not that simple uh, because we know that there is an inverted U-curve profile, not just for glucose and insulin in the brain, but also for noradrenaline, uh, dopamine, and other receptors that we know are involved in, in pain suppression. That means if you have a, a low dose of um, dopamine, it might not do anything, but the high dose might actually not do either, nothing either, and we need the optimal dose to have an effect, which already means that if you lump studies in a meta-analysis with different dose, that of course this inverted U-curve will cause a problem. And we know this inverted U-curve profile is really how the brain seems to work in reality. Furthermore, there is a blood-brain barrier, so not all the medication that we could theoretically come up with will really enter the brain and do its job. Um, or we might say, well, we could have a look at it in another way. We could look at side effects and see how they relate. And this is what um, Belen Elgoyen has done. And what she found is that, for example, ACE inhibitors um, create tinnitus. So that if we modulate those ACE um, inhibitors and or create a, the opposite effect, an ACE activator, then that might actually be helpful for tinnitus. Um, the serotonin 1A or serotonin uh, transporter or other um, receptors related to serotonin actually involve, are involved in tinnitus and hyperacusis. So we know that we should modulate the serotonin, not just the 2A, but also the 1A receptor. And uh, COX-1 and 2, which are, uh, of course, characteristic for uh, non-steroidal non anti-inflammatory drugs, they can create tinnitus with associated hearing loss. Or we could develop new pathophysiological models that might help us in generating new treatments. For example, 
we know that there is a genetic um, predisposition for people to develop tinnitus. And strange, it might not be so strange now to see that specific genes that are involved in cytokine production, so in the immune response and in the, in the nervous system, such as neurotransmitters, growth factors, and ion channels, are um, if you have a polymorphism for it, that that might make you more prone to develop tinnitus. Now, there is not just a genetic component, there's also the epigenetic component, meaning that the psychological or a physical uh, uh, stress or trauma might result in epigenetic modification of your uh, genome. And ultimately, if you have a genetic, uh, uh, if you have a genetic polymorphism or you have um, epigenetic modifications by stress, trauma, noise exposure, chemical exposure, medication, drugs, or toxins, that might result in a neuroinflammatory state which then results in a transition from acute to chronic tinnitus. Now, if this model would be correct, that would lead to a potential um, avalanche of, of new treatments. For example, we could measure the polymorphisms and then treat the polymorphisms by adding specific uh, medication or food supplements to um, modify those, um, those changes. We could measure the microbiome and then treat it with probiotics, prebiotics, antibiotics, or even feces transplants. We could um, measure uh, methylation, uh, histone acetylation, chromatin remodeling, and uh, microRNA to uh, modify epigenetics and uh, therefore treat that then with drugs that are known to be epigenetic modifiers, such as um, silicoxib or silibrex, opioids, fluoxetine, amitriptyline, valproic acid, et cetera. Or if the patient is known to have an, um, a chemical or um, intoxication, then you create them with different kinds of chelators. Or you could uh, use neuromodulation in combination with uh, different uh, medications. So it just opens up an entire new um, field of treatment options if you develop a new theoretical model. Now, does this make any sense? Well, it could, for example, um, a lot of neuro, uh, cytokines, uh, TNF-alpha, interleukin 1b6, uh, 10, etc., are shown to be changed in tinnitus. And then we can look at um, food supplements or medications that work on this specific, um, on this specific uh, cytokine, such as um, all these uh, food supplements that are specific then for those uh, different uh, um, cytokines or medication that works, that work on these different cytokines. Now, this is all theory and you say, yes, so what? It sounds good, but do we have any arguments that it's really like that? Well, the first uh, data do show that it might indeed be a way to uh, move forward as an antioxidant um, cocktail has then been developed that shows that it can improve tinnitus loudness, even, even if it's very moderately in a placebo controlled way. And that certain diet, meaning some food supplements or some vitamins such as high vitamin B12 level or protein rich diet or coffee, uh, might actually lower the odds of having tinnitus if you, um, it doesn't mean that you can use them as a treatment, that it, but maybe could be preventive, um, and that you have a higher odds of tinnitus when you have high intake of calcium, iron, and fat. So it does make sense to, um, to embark on testing those uh, new approaches for pharmacologically treating the patient. So in conclusion, the pathophysiology of tinnitus is only partially unraveled. And the essential talk is to further elucidate the pathophysiology because that will lead to new treatments. Um, and this is better than the random attacks that we've seen based on the network signs. So pharmacologically, treating the brain and neuroinflammation may both be beneficial or um, maybe both together. That will automatically lead to the fact that we might need a cocktail rather than monotherapy. And 
Of course, new approaches are highly needed. And so we should combine treatments that target different neurotransmitters, hormones, cytokines, ion channels, epigenetics, and the microbiome. And ideally, we would do that in a personalized way um, based on genetic and the epigenetic profile. So we've just started uh, with the pharmacological approaches for tinnitus, but at least there is a theoretical way on how to move forward. And I thank you for your attention.